Welcome back to Music 239, Introduction to World Music. Today, we are going to be studying music of your own backyard, traditional music of the Ozarks. And you could also label this simplicity and frugality in Ozarks folk music. We start with a song that came over from England called the Ram Song probably originated in Ireland because it's also known sometimes as the Darby Ram, and Darby is, uh, is a location in Ireland. It's a typical exaggeration song that is uh, uh, very typical of a lot of English and Irish folk songs in which various features of the ram are exaggerated. And so uh, it was the largest ram that ever fed on hay, the horns were so large, so the horns were so big they reached to the moon. The butcher went up in February and didn't come back till June. Uh, those kinds of exaggerated features of the animal are every verse has a different kind of feature exaggerated. This is the version that is found in most English folk songs, and it's in 6 8 time, which is a compound meter, uh, fairly complicated. But the, uh, the song goes something like this as you see it on your PowerPoint. As I went up to Derby upon a Derby day, I bought one of the finest rams, sir, that ever was fed up on hay. And it's I me dingle Derby to me dingle Derby day. It was one of the finest rams, sir, that ever was fed up on hay. Now, let's think about some of those words. To me, I me dinkle darby. What do those words mean, to me and I? Does that have any kind of meaning? Not really. It's just kind of a placeholder, right? Could it be called a vocable, perhaps? similar to the vocables that we've seen in Native American music in the previous unit, there are words that serve as placeholders or vocables in this music as well, even though it's European folk music. Now, what's going to happen when this song comes over to the Ozarks? Okay, what's going to happen? Well, we're going to see that in just a minute. It's got a verse-chorus structure, which means that the part where you're singing about the, uh, uh, the actual features of the ram, horns were so tall, they reached to the moon, that kind of thing, those are all part of the verse. And then when you get to the I me dinkle darby, okay, that part was the, uh, uh, that part was the chorus. Okay? So we have a verse-chorus structure. Now. Uh, there are three versions of this song on the Max Hunter Folk Song Collection site. And if you want to go take a look at those sometime, uh, you're certainly welcome to do that. The, the collection is found at the website that you see listed on your PowerPoint. Uh, you're going to have an assignment for next time that's going to be asking you to access this site. So uh, you're going to get to become familiar with it. Where did this website come from? Well, a refrigerator and ice salesman named Max Hunter from the 1950s to the 1970s traveled around the Ozarks in northern Arkansas and southern Missouri collecting folk songs, and he ended up with about 1,600 of them. And those are all down in recorded form at the Greene County Public Library. About 10 years ago, the university took on the project of moving those onto a website so that people could access them from all over the world. And it's turned out to be a wonderful research tool for people who are, um, uh, people who are researching Ozark folk music. Now, the three versions of the Darby Ram that you'll find on the Max Hunter site are all a little different, and a couple of them are a little bawdy. B-A-W-D-Y, what does that mean? body. Any guesses? Yes. Ah, yes. It has uh, maybe languages and reference in, in it that uh, could be considered objectionable by some. So that's my disclaimer. If you go check this site for the Ram song or the Darby Ram, uh, some of them you'll find are slightly uh, off-color versions of these songs. 
And in fact, uh, there's a great story that Max Hunter used to tell of a female folk singer that wanted to sing him a, a, a body version of a folk song for his collection, but she felt embarrassed to sing it to a man. And so Max had to bring his wife Virginia along the next time he went to that town so that she could sing it for her. <laughs> so she'd sing it for his wife, but he couldn't be in the room because she just felt uncomfortable doing that. So uh, that's the only reason that song ended up in the collection. I love that story. It's just a, just a great one. Um, so if, as you look at Ozark's versions of the Ram song and compare it to the one that we saw earlier, one of the things that you notice is that it changed from being in a compound meter 6-8 time where there are actually six eighth notes to the measure to being in more of a simple meter 2-4 time or 4-4 four, four time. And the whole point is that when some of this music made its way to the Ozarks, there tends to be a tendency in the Ozarks to simplify materials that have come in from the outside. Uh, and in some cases, to simplify materials that have been newly composed. Here's another version of the same song. Okay, and there have been some changes made. This is a version that was sung by a folk singer named Willis Case in Marshfield, Missouri, and he performed this song in the year 1999, and the recording that you're going to hear in just a minute is of Willis Case singing this song at that time. He was in his 80s when he performed this song, but he tells a little bit about where it came from. Uh, his, uh, his grandfather, who fought in the Civil War, uh, sang this song, and this is the specific version that came down to him. So we know that this version is at least from the 1860s, probably dates earlier than that. Now, listen to the difference in how this is handled. As I went down to Dallas Town, t'was on the market day, the biggest sheep I ever saw, they fed him there on hay, and t'was poor old Inkle Darby, Poor old Dinkle Day, poor old Dinkle Darby, poor old Dinkle Day. The location has changed. We're no longer in Darby, Ireland. Now we're in Dallas town. Okay, so the location has been moved to an American location. Even though the word Darby is still in there, it has nothing to do with being in the British Isles anymore. Also, the meter has been changed to a simple meter rather than a compound meter, where the beat is divided by two instead of by three. Interesting kind of uh, uh, comparison we can make about uh, division by two and by three, and we'll study that when we look at African music uh, in our next unit. But right now, I think the main point to understand is that there is a simplicity about this music that is very Ozarkian. Let's listen to the Willis Case performance of this. He describes just a little bit about it in advance, and so you'll hear a little bit of his discussion, and then he will go into his performance of the Darby Ram. In his case, he titles it Dinkle Darby. Now, I'm neither singer. I've been an auctioneer for 50 years, and I'm not a musician in any shape of, uh, of any kind of notes that I can think of. But I'll attempt to sing this song that's handed down to me from my father. And then uh, the records may show that this was really an old song. And it begins like this. As I went down to Dallas town, was on the market day, the biggest sheep I ever saw, the fed in their own hay, and t'was pulled ankle darby, pulled ankle day, pulled ankle darby, pulled ankle day. He had four feet to walk upon, and eyes to look around, and every time he turned around to cover an acre of ground. Was pulled ankle Darby, pulled ankle day, pulled ankle Darby, pulled ankle day. 
see horns on his head. They reach to the moon where the butcher went up in February and never come back till June. And it was cold and cool derby, cold and cool day, cold and cool derby, cold and cool day. The 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 butcher uh, uh, the wool on his head, the wool up on his back, it reached to the sky where the eagle built the nest for I heard the young ones cry and was pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day, pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day, the wool on his back, the wool on his the wool on his breast reached to the ground where the wolves built their dens. For I heard the young ones growl, and was pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day, pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day. The wool on his tail wore forty yards of cloth. For I heard the weavers say that they wove it in the day. It was pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day, pulled and cold derby, pulled and cold day. Important things about researching any kind of traditional music is authenticity. You want to make sure that the material you're getting is authentic and has not been corrupted, as it were, by mass media <coughs> or some other source. In a case like this, we can be pretty sure that this is the version that Willis Case heard from his grandfather that had been passed down since before the Civil War in the United States, uh, just because of the way he talks about the song. Max Hunter, as he started uh, collecting his songs, was very, very careful to make sure that any song that he felt had actually come from another source outside the Ozarks region uh, would be erased. And uh, there was one story he told about how he was looking for a particular version of a song, and he finally found a woman who could sing it for him, and he recorded it, and it was just fabulous. And then she happened to mention that she had heard part of that song uh, uh, from a cousin of hers that was from California. And he was so sad about it because his rule was, if it's not from the Ozarks, it's not authentically Ozark music and therefore we can't have it in the collection. And he had to erase that song and he'd worked so hard to find it and it was just, it just killed him to have to do it. But uh, he was very true to his own particular rules of engagement where collecting songs were concerned. We're going to take a look at that website in just a bit, but first I want to continue to talk a little bit about this version of the song as compared to the earlier version that we saw in 6-8 time from the English folk music songbook. First of all, there is a simplicity and directness in approach. No wasted effort. Everything is compressed to a simpler meter to be much more direct and, uh, and, and much less fancy than the European version. There's a quotation here that comes from a publication entitled Introduction to Traditional Violin Playing in Missouri, published in 1989. Uh, and there is a similarity in this quotation to the kind of principle I'm talking about, about simplification, where Ozark fiddling has always been emphasized, the hard driving fast reels for dancing Tunes have kept a distinctive mountain sound and their melodies are comparatively simple. The, the simplicity feature of this music is the one that you see more and more as you go through. Now the other part of today's talk is about frugality. The Ozarks people are a frugal people. They often had a, what is described as a hard scrabble existence. Having to make something out of nothing uh, was a very common thing for people who lived in the Ozarks before the days of electricity and mass media. And 
we're going to see that in some of their music as well. Here's a song called the Hound Dog Song, which comes from the Ozarks region. It's found in the Vance Randolph collection of Ozark folk songs, which you can find in Meyer Library. Uh, it's a four volume set, and uh, we'll be looking at a couple of songs from that collection. Those, these songs were collected back in the 1930s and 40s. The Hound Dog Song is a very famous Missouri song, and we're going to, uh, we're going to learn to sing it in just a few minutes. Okay, and uh, we're going to have a little performance, so we're going to do a class performance of this song uh, in just a few minutes, but I want to talk about it first. Hound Dog Song has been around for quite some time. Anybody ever heard of Champ Clark? Who was Champ Clark? Champ Clark was a senator from Missouri, U.S. senator. Uh, was a presidential candidate in 1912. And in fact, he almost got the Democratic nomination for president that year, but uh, there was a two-thirds rule, and he couldn't quite get two-thirds of the delegates, and so the Democrats went with a compromise candidate named Woodrow Wilson instead. Yeah, so Champ Clark just missed probably getting to be president because the Republican Party got split that year because of Teddy Roosevelt and his independent Bull Moose campaign running against Taft. So the Democrats were going to win whoever the candidate was and um, didn't end up quite being Champ Clark. But the Hound Dog song was his campaign song during that uh, very short presidential nomination bid that he made. It, uh, there's a legend that it came from Forsyth based on an actual incident that happened involving a couple of men that came to town at, with their dog. And you're going to hear the story as you hear the song. Uh, it's based on a pentatonic scale similar to the Native American music that we've seen. It comes from a tune called Big Taters in Sandy Land or Big Sweet Taters in Sandy Land. And we're going to hear the origination of this tune. It actually comes from a fiddle tune. Um, and uh, w the, the legend is that there was a man named Steve. No one knows his last name. But Steve uh, decided to plant potatoes in a very sandy soil. And all of his neighbors told him, this will never work. They're not going to grow there. It's no good. You can't grow potatoes in sandy land. Well, Steve planted the potatoes anyway, and that year the weather conditions were such that he was the only one that got any potatoes at all. <laughs> all of his neighbors, their potato crops were ruined, and the ones in the sandy soil were the only ones that uh, survived. And so to sort of uh, rub it in the face of the neighbors who told him he couldn't do it that way, he wrote a song called uh, Big Sweet Taters in Sandy Land. And uh, that's where the fiddle tune came from. And we're going to hear several different variants on that uh, in just a bit. But uh, the, the uh, frugality aspect is that uh, often you see tunes getting used for multiple purposes here. And uh, uh, as you can see on the PowerPoint, there are four or five different titles of tunes that are all basically the same one, a hound dog song, Great Big Taters, Sally Ann, Sail Away Ladies, Quick Kicking My Dog Around, which is the same as the Hound Dog song, and Sally Ann are all basic variants of the same tune that may or may not have come from this incident with the planting of potatoes. Frugality, then, if the, uh, as, as, uh, as Minrose Quinn said in a documentary made about the Ozarks, uh, that if they had to, they could make something out of nothing. Uh, there is a bit of frugality involved with taking that tune and stretching it a long way with lots of different variants. Anybody done any farm work in here? Anybody, anybody hauled hay? Okay. How many different things can you do with baling twine? Bunch of stuff. Yeah. Like everything. You use baling twine and baling wire to fix anything, right? That's, that's frugality, making something out of nothing. It's, it is very, very uh, uh, traditional to the Ozarks, and it exists with the music as well. Now, let's do a performance of the Hound Dog song. 
first, in order to do that, we're going to need to learn the chorus. And uh, we have a guitarist who's going to help us with that. Chris, can you come on up? Okay. The words up here, every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound, they got to quit kicking my dog around. Okay? We're going to go about this tempo. And two, and three, four. Go ahead and start. Okay? Everybody sing with me. Ready? And every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. they got to quit kicking my dog around. Try it again. One, two, three, four. Every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. You gotta quit kicking my dog around. Okay, now I'm gonna start singing verses, and you come back in with a chorus after each verse. Okay? Me and Lim Briggs and old Bill Brown took a load of corn to town. My old gym dog, Henri Old Cuss, he just naturally followed us. Every time I come up to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. We gotta quit kicking my dog around. Okay. As we drift past Johnson's store, a passel of yaps come out the door. Jim, he scooted behind a box with all the colors of throwing rocks. Every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound, you gotta quit kicking my dog around. They tied a can to old Jim's tail and brought him past the county jail. That just naturally made us sore. Then he cussed and Bill he swore. Every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. We gotta quit kicking my dog around. Let's see now. I gotta remember the next verse. Let's see. Me and Red and Briggs and old Bill Brown lost no time of getting down. We wiped them fellers on the ground for kicking my old Jim dog around. Every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. You gotta quit kicking my dog around. Now here comes the fun verse. Jim seen his duty there and then. He lit into them gentlemen. Sure bust up the courthouse square with rags and meat. I care. Every time I come to town, the boys keep kicking my dog around. Makes no difference if he is a hound. We gotta quit kicking my dog around. Okay, good job. So, so what's the story? These guys come to town. What happens? They messed with his dog. What did they do? Yeah, they tied cans to the dog's tail and ran him through town, right, past the county jail. So the guys got mad, and they found the guys that had did it, and they all got in a big fight. And then the dog joined in, and, and, and it all turned into a big, uh, a big melee, right? Okay, so this is apparently based on an actual incident that some say happened in Forsyth, Missouri. Anybody here from Forsyth? No? Okay. Anybody here from Aurora? Close to Aurora? Okay, you know where Aurora is? Yeah, east, west of here on 60, okay? Uh, Aurora, uh, the, if you go to Aurora High School, you find that the uh, mascot is the hound dogs, the Aurora hound dogs, and it comes from this song. Now, this is a very famous Missouri folk song that, that, that it's important to know about. But, like most folk songs, it did not come out of nowhere. The frugality of the Ozarks region uh, made this song actually come from the earlier variants of Great Big Taters in Sandy Land or Big Sweet Taters in Sandy Land or 
Sally Ann, or Sail Away Ladies, all of these songs are interrelated and they're fiddle tunes from which the Hound Dog song, uh, the tune of the Hound Dog song was taken. So instead of singing, every time I come to town, you might have been singing, great big sweet, big sweet taters in sandy land, I plant taters in sandy land, I planted taters in sandy land, okay? getting back at your neighbors for, for making fun of you. That's, that's where the conjecture is that this song may have originated. Now, you're going to be hearing from a guest artist in our next session named Gordon McCann. And uh, Gordon will be here playing guitar for uh, a young fiddler who is uh, just a wonderful young player, and you're going to hear her next time. Gordon is a local resident here in Springfield who is a folk song collector in his own right uh, and goes to various fiddle uh, competitions and performances and records the music that's performed. And he has a collection of I don't know how many songs of fiddle tunes that have been played around the Ozarks here for the last, couple, uh, last two or three decades. An amazing collection. We're going to hear him perform tomorrow but all of these songs come from the Gordon McCann collection, and Gordon was kind enough to provide them to me for the use in this class. So what we're going to hear are some performances of fiddlers in the Ozarks performing the variants on this uh, uh, Big Sweet Taters song, and I hope that you will recognize the relationship between that and the Hound Dog song that you just sang. So we're going to hear uh, Lon Jordan playing Great Big Taters from 1941. And then Sally Ann, played by Bill Ballou in 1943. We're going to hear Sail Away Ladies, played by Fred Stone King in 1995. Quit Kicking My Dog Around, Art Galbraith in 1977. And finally, Lonnie Robertson, Sally Ann, 1979. And uh, it's on a tape here, so I may have to fast forward occasionally through some portions so that we can hear ver versions of all five performances of this song. We're going to start then with Great Big Taters, Lon Jordan, 1941. Big Sweet Tater in the Sandy Land. <laughs> Fiddlin' Bill Blue and Dion and let's have her bill. <laughs> Let's hear another version, Sail Away Ladies, Fred Stone King. Great Dictator 
through Sandy Land, too. I was trying to think of... Uh, Let me play that one. That you uh, sounded all lot like you were talking about. That's that. Yeah. Oh, say oh, yeah. Say oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Which one that? Yeah. Yeah. You've been playing G, haven't you? Yeah, he's been playing G. They're talking about the relationship of these songs and how they're getting confused. Now, wait a minute. That one's Sail Away Ladies, and that one's Sally Ann, and this one's Quit Kicking My Dog Around, and, and, and they're all so interrelated that the players themselves are getting confused on which one they're doing at what time. And that was the discussion that you were hearing right there. Finally, uh, a performance by Lonnie Robertson of Sally Ann, 1979. these songs very, very interrelated, pointing up the frugality of this style. So what are the Ozarks region? Well, if you look on a map, you can see that the Ozarks plateau basically, and, and, and the Ozarks region basically is, it can, consists of the Ozarks plateau, which is where Springfield is, then down into the uh, Boston Mountains, Arkansas Valley and the Wachita Mountains, which are down in uh, Arkansas and Oklahoma. So parts of Oklahoma, Arkansas, and Missouri constitute uh, the traditional Ozarks region from which most of this music comes. Now, I spoke earlier about the Vance Randolph collection, which you find in Meyer Library. And uh, from that, one of the volumes had the Hound Dog song. There are four volumes in this set, though, and there is a full volume in this collection of play party songs. Play party songs. What was a play party? Well, not exactly. Not exactly. In fact, uh, the question was, does there, is like a jam session where everybody sits down and plays and we see what happens? Uh, no, that's not what it was. A play party, let me describe a play party, okay? You, you are 16 years old, okay? And you go to the, uh, uh, the building where the play party is going to be, or it might have been in someone's house, and someone sings a song and the boys stand on one side, the girls stand on the other, they all come together, they swing their partner, and they go back to, the back, to, to, their, to their respective sides. Now, what does that sound like to you? Sounds like a square dance, doesn't it? But no, the religion does not allow us to dance during this time, right? The very strict religious beliefs of the Ozark region, primarily Baptist at this time, does not allow dancing, and therefore, this is called a play party. It's not a dance, okay? So it's dancing in disguise, essentially, uh, and there are no instruments because the fiddle, in particular, is, uh, is looked down upon by the uh, religious uh, powers that be as an uh, instrument of the devil. Okay, uh, a lot of sources that, that, that show that particular correlation to be taking place. So therefore, no fiddle music, no banjos, no instruments are allowed at a play party. It's all singing. Now, the song that we're going to take a look at from this particular collection is called Weevely Wheat. Weevely Wheat. What do you suppose that means? Yes? Um, they pick the wheat and they found the, there are weevils in it and they're able to spread their bugs. Yes, the boll weevil was the scourge of the South. When it got into wheat and other grains, uh, it would pretty much eat the crop. And so, Weevely Wheat was not a good thing. 
let me sing it to you so that you can see how the song goes. Oh, I don't want none of your weevily wheat, and I don't want none of your barley, but I'll, let's see, but I want some flour in half an hour to bake a cake for Charlie. That's the song. And you would be dancing, or doing a play party, I should say, to that song, because dancing's not allowed. Okay? And there are several verses that you might be singing. I'd like to marry Charlie Boy, but I wouldn't marry his cousin. I can get plenty of men like you for 40 cents a dozen. Okay? Now, probably uh, the young ladies would be singing that verse, right? Uh, I must have your best of wheat, I must have your best of barley, and I must have your best of rye to bake a cake for Charlie. Hearing a lot about Charlie here in all of these verses, who do you suppose that was? The handsome guy in town, yeah, maybe. There's actually a historical reason for this song. Where do you suppose this song came from? Where did uh, Dinkle Darby come from? Europe. Europe, right? It came from Ireland, the Darby Ram that came over here and became Dinkle Darby. So Weevely Wheat came from some song that came from Europe. Now. Who's a famous Charlie in Europe? King Charles. King Charles of England, yes, he's the one, but there's another Charlemagne. one. Charlemagne is another one, but that's not the one I think they're thinking about here. Who was specifically called Charlie? Bonnie Prince Charlie of Scotland. Everybody heard of him before? Okay, well, without going into English and Scottish history a whole lot, uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie was, uh, the Scottish people believed him to be the rightful heir to the throne, but when James I of England took over both the thrones of both Scotland and England, uh, Bonnie Prince Charlie was essentially uh, uh, replaced and had to go over to France so that he wouldn't get executed by the English. The Scottish people always felt like he should have been their king, and uh, they made up lots of songs about that. So Charlie makes it into this song because wherever this song originated, and I'm not quite sure the origin of it, but wherever it started, uh, it was singing about Bonnie Prince Charlie. But by the time it gets to the Ozarks and ends up as a play party song in the Vance Randolph collection, it's called Weevely Wheat. And they're singing about the crop getting eaten by the bull weevil. Now there's nothing European about that. The bull weevil and the, and the wheat crop is strictly an American problem. So we've got Bonnie Prince Charlie being sung about in a song that's really about uh, uh, the wheat crop, and we have an interesting combination of cultures. Like we've seen with so many of the cultures that we've studied so far in this course, uh, you, get, you take one culture and you mix it with another and you get some interesting results like we saw in the Navajo music, for example, uh, the, um, uh, the, the song that we saw where they had uh, taken the country styles and mixed in the Navajo characteristics, right? Remember that, okay? Their particular uh, version of that Johnny Cash song. So there, there's another example here in the Ozarks of that kind of cultural combination, okay? So, there, there's a number of verses here, and one of the verses that, uh, um, that uh, is not showing up here very well that I want to tell you about is, um, um, grab her by the lily white hand and lead her like a pigeon, make her dance the weevily weed and lose all her religion. That's a verse that's in there. Now, what's that about? <coughs> yes. It's not talking about sex. It's talking about dancing. Because if a person got caught dancing, they were liable to get kicked out of their church. Right? There, there, were, there were all sorts of, uh, uh, of uh, ramifications for that. And, and, and some religions could actually literally kick you out of the church. Uh, Mennonite congregations, you might get shunned. Uh, there, there could be various kinds of religious ramifications for getting caught dancing. 
make her dance the weevily weed and lose all her religion is one of the verses of this song. So clearly the culture and the music are intertwined in this situation. And it's the culture from around here in the Ozarks that we're looking at. So uh, a fascinating study, I think, of, of how these kinds of things can take place, the simplicity and the frugality of Ozarks music, and then also the play party songs tied in with the religion and the culture and the music all in one big package. Okay, the assignment for next time then is to write an essay in which you compare and contrast the following songs that are on the Max Hunter website. They are both entitled Pretty Polly. You'll actually find about uh, eight different versions of Pretty Polly along with variants on the Max Hunter site. And um, there's also a fiddle tune called Pretty Polly that has nothing to do with those songs. So uh, some of them are varieties of each other, and in some cases they are completely different songs with the same title. Once again, frugality here. But on the Max Hunter site you will find two versions of, of uh, Pretty Polly that I want you to listen to, number 826 and number 542, and talk about the music and how it's performed by the performers, and then also talk about the text, because these songs have differences in how the text is handled and what the storyline is. Yes, Sandy? How thorough do you want our explanation to be? Uh, enough to create uh, about one page typed, okay? So I'm not looking for you to go on and on and on and write a five page essay here. One page uh, essay, two or three paragraphs is, is fine with me, but uh, uh, do, uh, do enough so that you go into some, uh, some detail on some aspect of what's going on, okay? Now, how do we get to the site? Let's go ahead and, and, and do that. Does everybody have this information? Okay. To get to the Max Hunter site, you can go to the university's website and just type in after the edu slash folk song slash Max Hunter. And you will get the web page for the Max Hunter site. There's a variety of ways of getting to these songs. Since you actually have the numbers, you could do it that way. Because if you scroll down, you'll see that you can browse the collection by song title, by singer, or by catalog number. And since you actually have the numbers there, you can save yourself a little time and do it that way. Uh, can somebody remind me what those numbers are? Okay, so let's look at 542. 542, Pretty Polly, and bring that up right there. This was sung by Harrison Burnett in Fayetteville, Arkansas, August 18, 1960. Uh, you have two options on how to play this song. One of them is to play real audio, and the other one is to play AIFF files. Uh, some, some of your browsers might work better with one of those options than the other, so that's why a couple of options are there. So, so what am I looking for in this essay? You're going to look at and listen to these two different versions of these songs, and you're going to compare and contrast. Clearly, there will be some kind of comparison that can be made between the songs. Obviously, they both have the same title. Right? They both come from the Ozarks. But as far as the storyline behind the text goes, you're going to find that there will be some changes in how one singer approaches it and the other one does. Okay? You're going to find some, some real changes there in terms of how the storyline comes out in one version as compared to the other. Talk about that in your essay. 
uh, talk about how the performances are done. Uh, which, which performer did it better? Which performer was, uh, was more uh, to your liking as a, as a listener? Those are the kinds of things I'm interested in hearing about on this essay. So um, uh, let's get those in tomorrow and uh, we will then continue. Our next uh, session, we will have guest performers doing Ozarks music, and then after that, we will be getting African music. So begin to read over the chapter three on African music and listening to the CD associated with that. We'll see you next time.